This is Mrs. Palmer Quay with the second video for Unit 7. This video is going to cover the central nervous system. As you should remember, the central nervous system is, consists of the brain and the spinal cord, and its job is to process information and then act on it. Both sensory neurons and motor neurons take care of bringing information in and taking action out. But most of the central nervous system is composed of the association neurons, or also called the interneurons. And so this is the processing, the analyzing, the thinking part of your nervous system. To just say a little bit more about nerve impulse processing, in the central nervous system, the interneurons are organized into neural, neuronal pools, which have a common function. And so we've got places in your brain, as we'll get into a little bit later, where you have a number of neurons that are working together. And so they are receiving input from other neurons. They're going to send output to different neurons. These neuronal pods may, in the end result, either excite or inhibit actions. And their connections are... Um, bringing together or sending out to more and more neurons, we, words we use, convergence or, or divergence. So in convergence, your neuron is receiving input from several other neurons. So we have a little picture over here to help you visualize this. So that it may be receiving information from different types of sensory receptors coming into an interneuron to have that information analyzed and processed and a decision being made as to what to be done about it. So this um, makes it possible for your, your nervous system to think about things on a greater level. And it also can allow a number of inputs to add together so that you've got enough information coming in to indicate that it is time to do something. The opposite uh, type of connection is divergence, where you have one neuron sending impulses to several different neurons. So we have a picture of that here. And this will, of course, amplify an impulse that one neuron will cause two neurons to respond, which could cause four neurons, and on and on to much, much larger amounts. So in this case, a single neuron may be able to amplify its impulse enough to activate some motor, neuro motor units so that you can actually have muscle contraction that is triggered by even a single neuron. The central nervous system is quite highly protected, and this is such an important part of your body, of course it would make sense that there'd be lots of protection. The layers of protection start with the bone. You have the cranium and the vertebral column surrounding your central nervous system. The neural tissue is surrounded in meninges, which are three distinct membranes, and we'll get to those in a minute. And they also are cushioned by the cerebral spinal fluid. This fluid circulates through the entire central nervous system, through the central spaces that are found in both the brain and the spinal cord, and also between the bone and the membrane, so it is inside and outside of your central nervous system. In fact, the brain itself is floating in cerebral spinal fluid. If you think about that, that makes sense. If you are um, just by the effects of gravity, putting pressure on a particular part of the body for a lengthy period of time, like you're sitting for a long time working on the computer, you'll begin to feel it. Your body will have um, complaints about having that part of the tissue compressed. If someone is bedridden, bedridden, they can develop bed sores because the dermal tissue has been compressed for so long that the blood supply has been cut off and the tissue begins to die. You don't want that to happen to your brain. So if the brain is floating, then you do not have pressure on the undersides caused by gravity. Even though gravity is trying to pull it down, it is floating in the cerebral spinal fluid and you don't have compression of your neural tissues. So this picture shows you your meninges, the three layers of tissue. On the very outermost part, they're named down here on the right, the dura mater is a thick membrane, very, very tough connective tissue with some um, blood vessels in it, and it is in the outermost layer. So up here we have this diagram that shows you first you have your skull, and then just under that is your dura mater. The dura mater is actually two layers, and sometimes it separates, and there's a space in between, one layer adhering more to the bone and the other one adhering more to the next layer, the next membrane, which is the arachnoid mater. Arachnoid um, is a group word for spider, web-like, and it is more web-like. You can see down here sort of there's some space and connections 
some thin strands of tissue connecting the membrane um, between the, the layer of the upper layer of the arachnoid membrane and then the next one in line, the pia mater. And so there, in this space, we do have some cerebral spinal fluid circulating. So this is the canal through which the cerebral spinal fluid circulates on the outside of the brain and spinal cord. And then below the arachnoid mater is the pia mater. This is a thin layer that adheres very closely to the brain. It actually goes in and out of all the folds of the brain, all of the gyri. And so, you know, it's going all around this brain, in and out. It's just stuck tight to all that neural tissue. It's in and out of all the openings in the brain. This is all pia mater that is all throughout here. So between the uh, space between the pia mater and the arachnoid mater, you have what's known as the subarachnoid space. Again, that is where you have the circulation of the cerebral spinal fluids. These membranes are not only around the brain, but of course they continue down into the spinal column. So your pia mater is first, and then on the outside of that is the arachnomater, and then the dura mater, and then you come to the bones of the vertebral column. Inside the brain, as I said, the cerebral spinal fluid circulates through cavities inside the brain, and these cavities have the name of a ventricle. And so the, there are four ventricles inside your brain. There are the lateral ventricles, which take the place as the, of the first and second ventricles. So you can see they are on the right and the left here as well. You've got two different views. The third ventricle, then more in the middle, <laughs> the fourth ventricle down around the brain stem, and then that leads into the central canal, which is a tiny space going all the way to the bottom of the spinal cord. It exits the bottom of the spinal cord, and then the, the material can loop around and come back up on the subarachnoid space to continue to circle around the outside of the brain. The ventricles allow the cerebral spinal fluid to reach into the interior section of the brain. They also provide some cushioning and protection um, along with you know, being around the outside, also on the inside, so there can be some uh, additional protection with that particular structure. So your cerebral spinal fluid is a clear, sterile fluid made from blood plasma, and it's made by specialized epithelial cells called the choroid plexus. They line all of the ventricles. So the epithelial lining in the ventricles, and of course in this picture we've got a sagittal plane, so we can't see the, the lateral ventricles particularly well, but we've got the third ventricle here and a little bit of the fourth ventricle right there, and then going down to the central canal. But this interior lining, the epithelial lining, contains specialized cells that can produce the cerebral spinal fluid. And then the epidymal cells, if you remember from the different types of neuroglia cells, the epidymal cells are ciliated, and they also are involved in lining the ventricles, and their little cilia beat and push the fluid around. So with this diagram here, you can see we've got some arrows showing that the fluid will circulate around the, in the subarachnoid space to all the way around the brain and then down to the base of the spinal cord. When it reaches down here, that loops back up again and heads its way um, around. The cere cerebral spinal fluid helps maintain the ion balances, the charged particles that are necessary for nerve impulse and many other cellular processes. It provides a cushion, as I said, a little bit of a shock absorber. It also is involved in several other homeostatic regulated proce regulating processes. But one that I found very interesting when I was doing research is that the volume amount, it normally is about 500 milliliters that is produced over the day. Um, there's about 200 milliliters circulating at any one time. But the amount, the exact amount of volume of cerebral spinal fluid can be adjusted. And if you've ever felt like your head is just too full and you can't think another thing, well, a intense burst of neurological activity will create waste products from all of the cellular activity that's involved in producing nerve impulses. And those waste products do build up. If you've been working really hard and using your brain, you, your body is not able to get rid of them as fast as you produce them. And so they build up in the brains and they actually cause your neurons to swell. And so your brain does become 
more full and takes up more space, and as a result, the cerebral spinal fluid will actually decrease the volume that's circulating to allow more room for those swollen neurons. So if you've ever had the feeling that your head is just too full to add another bit of information or to think any more right now, that's a physical feeling that's actually reflecting something that's really going on inside your neurons. We mentioned the blood-brain barrier when we were talking about the neuroglial cells earlier, that there are many harmful chemicals that will affect the brain very adversely. It's very, very sensitive. These things will travel through the blood, but we don't want them to move into our brain. And so there are three layers of defense that our bodies have been designed with in order to keep these chemicals or hormones or other um, substances that are needed to work in one part of the body, but to keep them out of the brain. First, there is a physical barrier. The capillaries in the, cere the cerebral area and the head are less leaky than most normal capillaries. And so carrier proteins are necessary to move molecules in and out. They're not able to leak through the thinly connected cells on the epithelial tissue surrounding the capillaries. There's also a chemical barrier that the cerebral capillary cells contain enzymes which are very active to break down neurotransmitters and hormones and other biologically active molecules. They have more enzymes than other epithelial cells in capillaries, so it's, it's the deck is stacked in your cerebral area to keep these um, chemicals from being around very long. They're very quickly gotten rid of. And then there are supporting structures from your neuroglial cells that the astrocytes wrap the capillaries and foot processes, which will add another layer to keep things from leaking out. They're also then involved in the regulation of moving things through because molecules then would have to move through two cell membranes provided by the astrocytes before they reach the cell membrane of the capillaries. So these three layers of defense keep things from moving into the brain. It can be a problem for doctors if there is an infection inside the brain and so that they have to take other steps to breach the barrier, to cause this barrier to fail in order to get antibiotics into the brain to treat an infection. So let's now work on looking at the brain itself. I'm sure that you are aware of the very important functions that are carried out by the brain. It is doing all of the analyzing and thinking, the memory, reasoning, um, coordinating what your body is doing, taking care of all the automatic things that happen in your organs. That's what the visceral activities are. Remember, viscera are your organs. And the brain determines to a great extent who you are, your personality, uh, what sort of things... Um, you know, how, how you react to the world around you. There are four parts of the brain that we're going to talk about. There's the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the brain stem, and the cerebellum. This little diagram shows you those different parts. The cerebrum here is the largest part of the brain, the outside section, and we'll get to each of these individually. The diencephalon is composed of the hypothalamus, which is on this, written on this side, and it's this little sex structure here, and the thalamus, along with the pituitary gland, the pineal gland, and several other structures, the optic nerve fibers and such. The brain stem actually includes three parts. They don't list the midbrain on here, and so it is, it is sort of shown um, hidden underneath part of your cerebrum, but here's your brain stem. So if you think about the brain as a flower, the cerebrum as a flower, the brain stem is holding it up. And then last, the cerebellum is this structure here in the back underneath the cerebellum. So let's start with the cerebrum. This is the part of the brain that has where you have your consciousness, where you have thought and memory, where your intelligence resides, where your personality can be found. The cerebrum is mostly white matter, and as you remember, white matter is the uh, myelinated axons of neural cells. There is a thin layer of gray matter, little gray cells, for those of you that read Agatha Christie Mysteries, and in the gray matter you have about 75% of all the neuron cell bodies found in the brain. The uh, outermost layer of the cerebrum is known as the cerebral cortex. You can see from this diagram there are several 
ways we divide it to talk about it. There is a division right down the middle, which is known as the longitudinal fissure, fissure being a deep division, and that divides it into the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. We also have smaller divisions, which are known as sulcuses. We've got a central sulcus here going, kind of wiggling its way through. Um, and so we can section off the brain depending upon how deep the grooves are. The individual folds that happen on the cerebral cor cortex are known as gyri, or as you group together, they'd be gyrus. You notice that the lobes of the brain are na named for the bones that they are underneath. So the frontal lobe is found under the frontal bone, the parietal lobe under the parietal bone. There is a temporal lobe that we don't see on this particular uh, perspective and the occipital lobe. And since the brain is divided into hemispheres, you would have a right and a left frontal lobe, a right and a left parietal lobe as well. In many cases, then we've got duplicates from one side to the other. Moving now on to the functions of the cerebrum, you're probably already aware that your left hemisphere tends to specialize in verbal, analytical, and computational skills. It's the more logical side of your brain, whereas your right hemisphere tends to specialize in nonverbal skills, things like body and motor orientation, patterns, finding patterns in music or in visual, uh, intuitive thoughts when you just know something. When most people, the left hemisphere is a little bit more dominant. Uh, some people are, are fairly evenly balanced. People who tend to be very, very strong in these nonverbal skills have their right hemisphere being the dominant part. But both sides of your brain are needed, and they talk to each other through the corpus callosum, which is a connection of neurons, the number of axons going back and forth between the right and the left hemisphere. For example, if you put your hand behind your back, and someone put a pencil in it, your right hemisphere would be the part of your brain that would identify what it was, would be able to feel it out and refigure out that this is a pencil. But your right hemisphere doesn't have, in most cases, doesn't have the ability for speech. If you're right-handed, your speech center is found on the left side of your brain. So your right hemisphere could identify that it's a pencil but couldn't tell anybody, but could send that information through the corpus callosum over to the left hemisphere where your speech center is found, and then you could say, oh, it's a pencil. So you do need both hemispheres to fully comprehend and to communicate. As I just said, um, speech is not bilateral, but most functions, especially when it comes to analyzing things using your interneurons or association neurons, they are bilateral. And interestingly, most of your input nerves are crossing over on their way up. They usually cross over in the brain stem. That is why if someone has an injury to the right side of the brain, the left side of the body is what is showing the effect. Because you have two hemispheres and that the functions are bilateral means that there's a great deal of redundancy in the brain, and that is an advantage if you suffer a certain type of brain injury known as a cerebrospinal accident or a stroke, where some part of the brain, the brain cells are dying because of insufficient blood supply. Because if it happens in a place where the function is bilateral, the other side of your brain can pick up many of those tasks. And over a period of time, you can develop the skills that you had initially lost because of the stroke. Here is a map of some of the association areas, the functions of the cerebrum. You do not need to memorize this, but notice that the primary motor cortex is right here in the uh, parietal lobe and your uh, sensory information. You have a som somatosensory cortex. It's sensory information coming in from your sensory nerves will be analyzed in this part of the body. And then you have, these are the thinking parts of your brain where physical activity is coordinated in this part of the frontal lobe and also down in the cerebellum when we get to that part. Um, over in the prefrontal cortex, you have things with judgment and emotion and being able to plan. And if you have an injury in any one of these parts of the body, these are the functions that you will lose. Memory of sound down here in the temporal lobe. Um, just, just gives you visual memory is in the back of your head, which is why you may see stars if you get hit in the back of the head. So these are all 
areas of the brain that we've been able to discover, you've got the neuronal pools where these association membrane or association neurons are all working together, handling the same type of information, analyzing the same type of information, and then sending out messages to motor neurons to have actions happen. The diencephalon is composed of your thalamus and hypothalamus. And as you remember, those are located sort of the, the central part of the brain, hidden in the middle. They actually surround the third ventricle. The thalamus is involved in relaying all sensory information to the part of the brain that then is going to analyze it. It is also the part of your brain that suppresses unimportant sensations. So if you wear a watch, you know that you don't really pay attention to the a feeling of the watch on your wrist. Your thalamus has discounted it as something that is unimportant. Also, the thalamus then would help you focus. You'd be able to tune out the distractions if your thalamus is working properly so that you can focus on whatever you're trying to do, reading or a particular task. You need to um, be able to not get distracted by all the sensory information coming in. The hypothalamus is very much involved in homeostasis. And we talked about it a tiny bit in the very, very beginning with the negative feedback loops. But the hypothalamus is controlling body temperature, balance of ions in the blood, whether you're hungry or not, are you awake or asleep, what's happening with your heart rate, your digestive systems, movings and secretions, etc. Very, very important part of the brain to keep you in balance. This is a stylized picture, so it's a little too round and perfect, but it's showing you where the, the diencephalon is found in the central part of the brain, and then here we have just an arrangement, the thalamus and then the hypothalamus underneath it. These are both two-lobed. There's a right and left side to the thalamus and the hypothalamus, just like you see in your cerebrum. Here's the corpus callosum, again, just in a stylized view, all of those axons of nerves traveling from the right and left hemisphere back and forth to allow communication between the two halves of your brain. Moving on to the brain stem, it's composed of three distinct parts, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. And there's, you don't need to remember distinct functions of these three parts. All three of them work together primarily as a path pathway for the spinal nerves, which come up together in groups called tracks, for the spinal nerves to reach the brain and the association neurons that will do the processing of their information. Certain vital functions are controlled by the pons and medulla. The pons is involved in respiration, especially the depth of the breath that you take. The medulla is involved in just keeping you breathing, one right after the other. The medulla puts out the pulses that will regularly encourage your heart to beat and your blood vessels to constrict to provide blood pressure and for you to take another breath. Because these exist then in the brain stem that are found at the very bottom of the brain, it gives you an, uh, an idea why a blow to the back of the brain actually can prove fatal. Because if you interrupt these vital functions, think of like vital signs when the doctor takes vital signs on a patient. If you interrupt the vital functions, then there really isn't any part of the brain to compensate for that. A person that I went to school with injured his brain stem and died from it um, from a fall out of the back of a pickup truck helping his girlfriend move. So I have personal experience of someone who hurt their brain stem and, and was proved fatal. In your brain stem, you also have certain reflex centers for things like coughing and sneezing, swallowing and vomiting. These things happen as reflexes. You don't have to think about coughing. It just goes when you need it, it happens. Here's a diagram of the brain stem. And as you see here, they're just showing some of the tracks that are heading off to the cerebellum, the cerebellum in this point, and here are some going off to the cerebrum over here. We've got a little bit of the diencephalon showing with the thalamus, and then as you see, it connects right onto the midbrain that goes right to the pons, which just sort of sticks out a little bit, and then down to the medulla oblongata which then becomes the spinal cord. So there's not any distinct, clear, distinct lines in between these different parts of the brain because, of course, it just basically merges one right into the other. Inside the brain stem, we have something called the reticular, for reticular formation, which is a network of nerve fibers scattered throughout the brain stem. And it connects the information coming in from 
the sensory, especially the auditory and visual senses, to the hypothalamus and to the basal nuclei, which are pieces of or small islands of gray matter within the white matter in the cerebrum, and also to the cerebellum and the cerebrum. And so what the reticular formation is especially important is, is in arousing your cerebral cortex into a state of wakefulness. If your reticular formation is shutting down, that's what happens when you fall asleep. And when you wake up, it starts feeding those sensory informations back to your cerebral cortex, the thinking part of your brain, and you become alert and awake. So it's very important in sleeping and arousal, and it's also just important in providing the sensory information to help transmit it to the parts of the brain that then can analyze and react on it. So here's a just a little diagram showing that uh, sensory input from the eyes are coming in on cranial nerve number two. We'll get to that when we get to the peripheral nervous system, and from the ears on cranial nerve number eight. And so it is processed here in the brain stem and then sent out to the cerebral cortex. And finally, the cerebellum, the fourth part of the brain, it is inferior, and again, this means below the occipital lobes of the cerebrum. It also is divided into two hemispheres, like many of the other parts of the brain, and it is involved in integrating sensory information concerning how your body is arranged. Therefore, it coordinates skeletal muscle activity and helps you maintain your posture. For those of you that were in a, my biology class where we watched the DVD, The Family That Walks on All Fours, if you remember, the problem with that particular family is that there was a genetic mutation leading to a smaller-than-normal cerebellum, which caused them not to be able to stand upright with any kind of balance. And here's a diagram of the cerebellum. There are three major nerve connections that the cerebellum teach, or uses to reach the rest of the brain and for whatever reason those are called peduncles so we have the superior, the middle, and the inferior peduncle being shown on this diagram. So three big nerve tracks bringing information in, taking information out. This particular diagram also is showing you the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle, that specialized epithelium that produces the cerebral spinal fluid. You can see that the cerebellum is also very grooved. Uh, this folding and grooving that happens on the surfaces of our brain allows more neurons to be packed in a smaller amount of space. Now let's move from the brain to the spinal cord. Of course, the spinal cord and is contiguous with the brain. It just moves right one from the other. We're talking the same nerves and nerve connections, the brain stem being the um, intermediary structure. If we want to talk about the spinal cord proper, it starts at the foramen magnum. That's that hole in the back of your skull that allows your spinal cord to come out. And it ends somewhere between the first and second lumbar vertebrae. You still have spinal nerves going further down the uh, vertebral column, but the cord itself is, has stopped at the beginning of your lumbar section. Like the brain, the spinal cord is encased in meninges, all three layers. It is bathed in cerebral spinal fluid through the central canal in the middle of the spinal cord and the subarachnoid space between the, the outer edge of the spinal cord and the bone of the vertebral column. And it contains both gray and white matter, like your brain. There are two major functions of the spinal cord. It conducts impulses to and from the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So it takes sensory information in and sends it to the brain, and it takes motor impulses that come out of the brain and conduct it out to the peripheral nerves. And it also serves as a center for spinal, spinal reflexes and reflex arcs, like we talked about in the first video. Looking at this diagram of the spinal cord, you can see we've got gray matter in the center, sort of in an H or a butterfly shape. Most of the neurons in the gray matter here are the association or interneurons. There are a few motor nerve fibers, but mostly that is um, interneurons in providing the gray matter. And then in the white matter on the outside, and we tend to divide that into three sections here, um, this is where you see the, the nerves traveling through. In fact, off on either side here, they've just done little diagrams of nerves that are feeding into the spinal cord. They would be attaching to a nerve track and be on their way to the brain.
Nerve impulses then are moving up and down the spinal cord all the time. Sensory information is going up and motor impulses are coming down. There are 31 distinct pairs of spinal nerves that emerge between each vertebrae, one on each side. When we get to the peripheral nervous system, we'll talk a little more specifically about those spinal nerves. This diagram shows some of the tracks, and you can see from the name here we've got the spinothalmic tract, so it is coming from the spine, and it's heading to the thalamus, and so that is one of your sensory tracks. The sensory tracks tend to be on the anterior side, so that is this side here on the bottom of the diagram. This deep groove or fissure in the spinal column is an indication that this is the anterior side or the ventral side, the front side. And then in the back, you're, you've got descending, or you've also got descending tracks, but the ones that are found, um, motor tracks, you can see we've got a cortical spinal tract, so it arises in the cortex and goes to the spinal column to then go out to the peripheral nerves, and so this would be motor impulses would be running down the cortical spinal tract, whereas sensory impulses run up the spinal thalamic tract. I want to talk briefly about two brain injuries, a concussion and a contusion. In a concussion, your head is jarred or shaken to the extent that you are bouncing the brain off the inside of the skull. This can happen by a blow to the head, it can happen by a fall, it can happen just a fall that jars another part of your body enough to really shake up your head. While as individual concussions are things that you can recover from, multiple concussions can have a cumulative effect. And we are seeing this now with some of the formal, former NFL athletes that are discovering um, early dementia and some other brain problems developing because they have had many concussions in their career as football players. We've also recently had several high schoolers, football players, um, die in the game because they had suffered multiple concussions. So even though a single concussion is something that may not seem like much you have to worry about, if you're having concussions on top of concussions, then you may have a cumulative effect that can lead to a fatality or certainly um, a brain injury. Individual concussions can range from a mild or severe, though the symptoms might be delayed, so something that at first appealed to, appeared to be quite mild might be not so. And some of the signs of concussion are just general confusion, dizziness, fuzzy vision, feeling out of it, groggy, not being able to concentrate, of course a headache, memory loss, nausea, or being more sensitive to your outside environment. So in a concussion, the, the brain is basically just bounced off the bone. In a contusion, the brain has actually been bruised. It's hit hard enough so that you've got blood leakage from some tear of blood vessels in the brain. You're having some swelling. This especially happens in parts of your cortex where the bone that it is running into has sharp ridges, like around the eye socket. Just the, the internal bone is just a little sharper than, say, the top of your head, and so you're much more likely to have a contusion. Depending upon the amount of swelling and blood leakage, if a hematoma forms, a little pool of blood, you may actually end up causing pressure on areas of the brain, which will cause further brain damage. Along with the signs that you have for a concussion, signs for a con con contusion include unconsciousness, especially more than just fleeting, changes in pupil size, especially if one of your, the pupils of an eye is larger than the other, impaired movement or sensory abilities, not quite able to speak, uh, problems with vision. If there is clear or bloody fluid draining from any of the openings, this is a sign of things that are very bad inside the skull, and so the emergency treatment is required to keep, possibly even to keep someone alive. So um, whenever you're experiencing a shaking of the head, this is not something to just brush off. Um, be alert for these signs or if you're involved in somebody else has been hit in the head. Going back to concussion, just uh, realize that football helmets and other protective gear prevent bones from being broken, but they're not going to stop the brain from being bounced off one side of the body or the other. I also want to just briefly mention an EEG. This is a test that detects the electrical activity in the brain.
An EEG is used to diagnose epilepsy, which would be seizure activity in the brain. It also can be helpful in determining if someone has a brain tumor or head injury, if a stroke has occurred, or some other type of brain dysfunction. An EEG is what is used to confirm brain death in the case of someone who's been in a vegetative state. Here's a sample of an EEG, the electroencephalogram, and the um, Wavelength and frequency of the electrical waves are what a technician would be looking at. So if you look at the difference between the incoming waves here and at this point, you can see that they have become slightly larger, slightly greater wavelength and greater amplitude, and so that's an indicator that there was in the left brain some type of seizure activity going on. So this covers what I'm giving you uh, is a flying introduction to the central nervous system. The next video will cover the peripheral nervous system.